Well, uh, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces uh, in, the, in the audience. Uh, I would like to start my talk uh, by giving a rough uh, agenda and also for people who are not entirely familiar with uh, my work, a little bit of context. Uh, so first of all, the beginning of my talk will be about prerequisites um, to understanding my actual contributions. Those will be the epipolar geometry and the law of X-ray attenuation. Um, I've presented, I'm presenting a uh, medical C-arm scanner on the right. Uh, just for those who are not familiar with those devices, there is an X-ray source on the bottom emitting X-rays and a detector on the top. Typically, the patient would be placed between those with uh, X-rays emitted on the, at the source and being detected at the detector. So followed by these basics, I will uh, give a, bit, a little bit of theory and uh, implementation of the epipolar consistency conditions. And uh, specifically, I'll take a look at a cost function to measure consistency and redundant information in images. Uh, in the second half of my talk, I will address three exemplary applications uh, that uh, all relate to motion estimation in X-ray images. Specifically, I'll be tracking an object, an unknown object, under fluoroscopy. Um, I'll uh, estimate uh, gating in uh, rotational angiography of the heart. And I will also present uh, briefly a 3D, 3D registration algorithm that does not use the reconstructed images, but rather works on the raw data of the image of the acquisition. Uh, so to start, I'll uh, briefly define what data consistency conditions are. Um, so first of all, two projection images in a CT, for example, computer tomography scan, are not independent, but they fulfill certain uh, consistency conditions. That's because there is redundant information in the two of them, and it's sort of like a checksum. So if there is uh, an error in the acquisition or some um, assumptions are not met, then these uh, this redundant information will not be exactly identical in the two images. Um, redundancy is a real uh, issue in analytic reconstruction algorithms where uh, proper weighting of that redundant information has to take place. And uh, this is also where some of the very important theoretical um, basics for the work that I'm presenting today have been rooted. Um, we will be using consistency conditions for artifact reduction or tracking in uh, motion estimation in X-ray images. Specifically, redundancy can also be exploited to correct for motion, for example, but also other measurement errors. So that's the same idea as the checksum. If you have redundant information, you can verify that it is the same. If it is not, you can also sort of adjust some of the parameters of the acquisition so to make the uh, redundant information as similar as possible. And this is also um, a work uh, by Cassine uh, Debla, which is probably the most important reference in this talk because it's uh, where the idea for the epipolar consistency conditions came about. Uh, when I saw this work, they did not understand it as an epipolar geometry setup. However, using their work and then adding epipolar geometry and all the mathematics from computer vision in resulted in the work that I'm presenting today. So just briefly, uh, what publications I'll be covering. There is a uh, mostly theoretical um, publication concerning epipolar consistency in transmission emission imaging uh, that was published in uh, uh, IEEE uh, Transactions Medical Imaging. And then there is uh, some implementation-related work, so very practical um, yeah, consideration on how to build a system that exploits epipolar consistency. Um, those will be covered in the talk briefly. And then the focus will be on three exemplary applications uh, that I've chosen for this talk that I already mentioned. Tracking and fluoroscopy, 3D registration, also virtual single frame subtraction imaging for the heart, so to estimate gating information. Uh, there is a lot of other um, publications, a lot of other, other work relating to consistency conditions, specifically epipolar consistency that have been developed uh, mostly since my TMI publication, so this is a, is a pleasure, and they, these are very interesting. They will be mentioned. However, they will not be the focus of this talk. So, as I said, I will be starting with some prerequisites to understanding um, the epipolar consistency conditions, specifically the epipolar geometry. And to do that, we have to be aware that uh, projection in, for a flat panel detector X-ray system is basically the same as in a photograph. You have a X-ray source, which is sort of like the lens or the camera center, and you have a flat panel detector, which serves as the image plane, uh, which is where X-rays are detected. So suppose that you can see uh, this conical shape on the detector somehow. 
then that is because in the ray path of the X-rays, there is some 3D object which attenuates some of the radiation. And you can think of it sort of like a shadow image. Um, however, with that shadow image, you cannot really be sure if you see that image whether that cone is at any particular position along the ray path and also not what size it actually has. So this is what brings us to uh, the epipolar geometry because with two images, things become easier. Looking at one image, you may not be able to estimate the actual location and the size of the object. However, if you have a second view of the scene, then you can because on the second view, the object will move quite drastically, actually. Now, interestingly, uh, this motion is not arbitrary. If you look at the tip of the cone, for instance, then that motion is actually along a line. And these lines I'll be talking about a lot today because that line is called an epipolar line. These lines are important because think of the construction as entirely symmetric. You might also start with the other image and then consider the possible motion of the cone from that, point, from that point of view. So you have a symmetric construction, you have two corresponding epipolar lines, and in fact, um, there is a plane defined by the two source positions uh, and any particular arbitrary point in 3D space. Then by intersecting that plane, called the epipolar plane, with the two detector images, you get two corresponding epipolar lines, which are also contained in that plane. So L0 and N1 are corresponding epipolar lines. Now, I've already mentioned that you can choose an arbitrary point to define that plane using the two source positions C1 and C0, and that red dot, which was the tip of the cone. Of course, you could use any other point in that cone, and you would find a lot of corresponding epipolar lines. Now, this is important because all these epipolar lines contain the baseline, which is the line passing through the camera cell, the source position C1 and C0. It's the green line here. Okay, so they all contain the baseline. This is basically the setup that I'll be talking about a lot. Now, the second ingredient to epipolar consistency is the law of X-ray attenuation. Uh, it's a pretty simple model. It's uh, basically saying under X-ray, solid objects such as the human body are behaving sort of like a fog or a non-transparent solution. And as the ray passes through that object, it attenuates, it sort of accumulates absorption along the ray, and then at some point you detect a remaining intensity image. So this is what you see on the left-hand side, where there is the spine, for example, there are, there are bones that are pretty dense to x-rays, so you see less intensity and a darker image. On the other hand, with the lungs, where there is air and less attenuation, you have brighter intensity. Now, this is an exponential fall-off, and this exponential function is not something that we're interested in particularly. So what usually happens in uh, computer tomography, for, for example, is to pre-process the X-ray images in such a way that what you have in each pixel is actually a line integral. So you can think of it as a summation of, um, well, absorption coefficients. So as you can see, it's a simple pre-processing with a logarithm and a scaling with an initial intensity. So whenever I say X-ray imaging from now on, what I'm actually talking about are line integral images such as the one on the right. Now, this basically starts the part uh, where my work came in. Uh, we're now putting the two concepts that I've explained together, the geometry of epipolar, um, well, a stereo system, two images, and the X-ray attenuation based on the simple Bear-Lambert law. So to do this, I'm just slightly rearranging detector and sources here. We still have two detectors and two X-ray sources um, and one particular epipolar plane. I'm using the character kappa just to pick out any particular epipolar plane since we have a 1D uh, family of such planes that basically rotate about the baseline. And for this particular plane now, we'll just consider sums of rays that are parallel. Now, it's not entirely true that rays are par parallel. That's true only if the X-ray source is very far away. But maybe we can say approximately they are parallel. If that is the case, then interestingly, a summation on any such epipolar line is a summation along the rays and an orthogonal summation along the line on the image. Now, if this is the case, then that's the same as summing over all absorption happening on that particular epipolar plane. Because of the symmetry, we can also compute the summation over all the absorption in that plane by looking at the other detector and summing over the intensity detected here. 
So this gives us two different ways of computing the same quantity, namely the total intensity on that apipolar plane. Yeah, so I've lied a little bit now. First of all, um, I've only considered uh, like this diamond shape in red here in the center, which is the part that is entirely mapped to the detectors. If any, de any intensity is basically, or any attenuation happens outside of that red uh, diamond shape, then that would not be consistent, it would not be, uh, it might, for example, be visible in one detector, but not in the other, particular, uh, if there's like an object located here in this area, it would be visible on this detector, but not on this one. So this is the one part that I lied about. The other part is the more obvious one. It is that the rays are not actually parallel. So um, the second part, I'm uh, just briefly going to say, what is done in order to sort of compensate for these non-parallel rays? And that brings me to, uh, well, the second part of my uh, implementation contribution, basically. The consistency conditions for epipolar lines. Uh, however, I will give two flavors of that, sort of three. Uh, the first is using something called rectification. Now, if you look here, you can see that there are, there's a virtual detector, plain and blue. And rectification basically means mapping the pixel information from the given images to that plane and doing that for both images. So what you get is virtually rotated images uh, that would, would be produced if the detector plane was the same. Um, this is interesting because in this setup, there is a known consistency condition that is slightly easier. It's basically a weighted integral. So instead of just computing the sum over this area, there's a certain weight that is applied per pixel. And then that is a consistency condition uh, that has been known for a while, actually. The second one uh, is a slightly better approach for our purposes anyway. And it is using an orthogonal filter. So you filter the integrals that you compute in an orthogonal direction. And there are two filters that are relevant here. That is the RAM filter and the derivative filter. Uh, I will be only looking at the derivative filter for the purposes of this talk because of the properties relating to motion compensation, but I will be uh, talking about that briefly in a minute. So let us just compare these two, and we'll just look at an example of what these epipolar consistency conditions actually do. Again, we have two X-ray sources, C0, C1, and two detectors in the corresponding colors. So here, uh, everything that happens in view 0 is red. Everything that happens in view 1 is green. And as an exemplary object, I just place a pumpkin in the ray path of the two images. So this produces these images. Please note that the frames of the images always relate to the color of the uh, projection geometry here. So you know which image belongs to which uh, projection. Now, um, what I'm doing now is I just pick out a few epipolar plane, in this case, this orange plane here. I'm intersecting with a detector that is basically uh, solving the epipolar geometry. And I get two corresponding lines in the images in orange here and here. So these would be two corresponding epipolar planes. I can do the same for two exemplary other planes. And you can see that there is also a bundle of lines in the images. What I'm doing now is, for each of these lines, you can also see the colors, the orange epipolar plane, the blue and the magenta epipolar planes. I can now compute the quantity that I mentioned. In this case, it is basically a summation along these lines and weighted by a, an appropriate weight that I'm not going into detail too much. So this would be the fanbeam consistency condition mentioned first. I do this for the orange line where there's basically nothing in the image, so I get a value of zero. I do it for the blue line where there's a little bit of intersection with the pumpkin at the top here. So I get like a small value, but non-zero value. And I can do the same thing for a line that passes almost through the middle of the pumpkin where there's a considerable amount of uh, um, absorption. So you also get a very high value for this consistency condition. Interestingly, and what is slightly difficult to visualize, you get the same value for both images. You can see I visualize this with green dots with red spikes on the, on the border. That's because, actually, for both images, red and green, you get the same exact value. And that is what the redundant information that I'll be using within the talk really is. I can do the same thing for all other possible lines. So you can imagine I'm basically sweeping through these images, sort of like that. 
and compute all these values. And again, the two curves perfectly overlap. This is unfortunately also a little bit difficult to visualize. You have a green line and you have a red line and the green line is dotted. But since the two lines are exactly overlapping, what you see is basically a single line that appears to be dotted red and green. Now, I've mentioned that there is a second consistency condition using the derivative filter in an orthogonal direction. This is now shown at the bottom. The idea is exactly the same, except uh, in addition to basically computing the line integrals in this direction, you're also computing a derivative in the orthogonal direction to the lines. So you get all the properties of a usual uh, derivative filter. That is, you have higher frequencies, more peaks. You have, in the first condition, only like one large blob of data that's basically just the amount of absorption happening, whereas here you're observing changes in that. And there is an unrelated publication now that shows that actually this is also the, the derivative, exact derivative of this curve. So here we go with a, a consistency condition that we can compute on any two arbitrary X-ray images, provided of course that they follow the physical assumptions that we've made and provided that there is no truncation. In the following, I will present a cost function. The idea is now to quantify the amount of inconsistency when you have two images and they're given geometry parameters. And uh, how this works, I will present also at an example. Um, this equation basically is the definition of the cost function that I use for epipolar consistency. What it shows is nothing else than the difference in a squared sum uh, sense between the two curves that we've seen in the plots earlier. The way that it is computed, however, is slightly different. Uh, you can see two images again, 0 and 1 here. And you can see something here that is actually called a radon intermediate function. What it is, is simply taking this image and summing up in one direction, slightly rotating, summing up again, rotating a little more, summing up again, and so on. So every time you sum up, you get one line in this uh, what is called a radon transform. Afterwards, there is a computation of a derivative in an orthogonal direction. This is nice because it can be pre-computed. Given image data, you can compute all these line integrals, which are basically all of these values, and they are then fixed. If you change the geometry parameters of your setup, for example, during an optimization of a cost function like this one, these values do not change. You can reuse them every time, which makes the algorithm quick. So basically, you can basically think of these complex um, symbols here just as these two images. Now next comes the actual geometric part. I'm again using a parameter of kappa, which sort of describes the angle of the epipolar plane around that baseline. And as you can see, it basically picks out two particular lines in these images. And what we'll also see is that it also picks out particular two points in these images. And what I'm showing you now is just a little uh, animation of what happens within that algorithm when this expression is computed. So first of all, you take a set of kappa values. I'm just putting kappa. Really, uh, it could be any set. What you would probably do is regular sampling on that image or something like that, actually in 3D space. And you would always go through these lines and compare the consistency values that you get. So you start at the bottom of the image, which corresponds to the left two points here. So the consistency condition states that these two points are identical. And you then just go through the entire image and always compare the values that you find on these lines. So this is basically what is required for two X-ray images to compute the consistency condition. Um, in the following, I will be presenting the first of three applications of this cost function that I've just defined. And I will be doing this in a setting of um, fluoroscopy. So what I've done here in this setup is to, again, use my pumpkin. But this time, maybe you can see there is a rope. I've suspended it from the ceiling, so it's hanging. And what you can also see is, again, the x-ray source. And what you can see is the detector here down on the bottom. So I'm producing images of this pumpkin while it is suspended from the ceiling. Now, if you give it a little bit of a push, it will be moving quite a bit. And the idea in this scenario is to track this motion. 
So you have a like rotating motion and you have a moving uh, like a motion sort of almost parallel to the table. So this is the setup that we have. I acquired two reference images. So this is basically of a pumpkin that is at rest, no motion. So these two should be ideally entirely consistent. And then there is an input image, which is this one. And it is shown here basically with a gray frame. And you're looking at this 3D geometry scene from the point of view of this image. And you can see that the other two images are sort of related to it in this manner. I've presented this 3D visualization because it also shows you how the epipolar lines well, come to be. You see that the direction of epipolar lines basically depends on the location of the projection of the other source position. And this is true for both images. And you can also see that the line direction is different in the two images. So the green one gives you these uh, top right to bottom left, and the, green, the red one gives you the top left to bottom right <coughs> lines. Okay, so let's compute the consistency condition as described. I'm showing you here again the same plot that you've seen before, but this time computed on real data under not very nice conditions actually. You see the two curves, they do not perfectly match, but you do also see that like the peaks are basically at the right positions. So this is what we're interested in. There are plenty of effects here, for example truncation of the table, maybe improper pre-processing of the data, um, maybe also some artifacts due to the fluoroscopy and the motion. All of this is shown as inconsistencies in this plot. It's very difficult to tell which is the reason for an inconsistency. However, if I compute this cost function that I've described earlier, and I do that for different positions of the pumpkin, I'm just presenting here shifts in u and v direction, so what I basically do is I sort of move the pumpkin up and, up and down in the image, and then I compute this cost function. What I see, what I get, is a plot like this one. This is now uh, 100 pixels in each direction, u and v, and what you can see is in the center there is a very low value. That's because it is aligned in such a way that the original correct alignment is in the center. What you can also see is that the values get higher as I move away from that center. However, in the direction of the lines, which is also this valley shape here, the value stays almost identical. I can do the same thing for the other image, and I will get a plot very similar to the previous one. It looks like this. Um, you can see also, again, it's a minimum in the center, and there's again a valley which is due to the direction of the epipolar lines. Now you might ask, why is there a valley in this cost function? The reason is that we're considering line integrals. So we are integrating over lines, and as we do this, this is something that, is, that just has no respect or reference to the location along the line. So I might compute the integral on this bottom line here, mm -hmm. and I might move the image in the direction of that line, and the integral would not change. And that's, because why, uh, that's why the epipolar consistency does not change very much if I'm moving in a direction that is sort of parallel to the line, or at least there is not a big angle. It's very good if you move it orthogonal to those lines. All is not lost. You can still determine a very clear position that should be correct, like in this plot. And that's by just assuming uh, both, or summing up both informations from the two images. You can see that due to the different direction of the epipolar lines, green and red, I get two different directions of the valley shape. By adding them up, I get a rather smooth and uh, circular kind of um, valley in that cost function, which is okay to optimize. Oh, sorry. Actually, I, I'm showing you now a short video. First of all, with two reference views that we've just seen, it is um, going to track just minor translational motion. Green is the ground truth, red is our estimate. So you can see it's sort of following it. And for four reference images and rather extreme motion actually. So here I've really given it a real push. And you can see that the red box is still sort of following the green one. Now, there is clearly still a little bit of a difference between the two but it is still a surprising fact if you think about it. We do not know the object. The only information about this pumpkin that we have is two or five reference views. So that's very little information. That's not nearly enough to make a 3D reconstruction. And you're still able to determine the 3D position. Okay, so that's that part. 
Which brings me to the second um, of my applications, which is estimating heart and respiratory motion in rotational angiography scans. I'm putting in this particular problem because um, a scan of the heart shows parts of the torso. Since the heart is the focus, for example, the rib cage is usually truncated. It is not within the image. Now, we've seen before, when you remember that red diamond shape that I've shown you, the epipolar consistency conditions assume that the entire information is present on the detector. This is clearly not the case here. Um, so the reason why we're presenting it is that we're able to still use epipolar consistency in this case. Because what we can do is we can uh, segment the vessels. There are standard algorithms to do this. And what you get is a mask. In this case, it's uh, drawn over the image in black of all the interesting vessels. So this is basically an image where all the information that we're actually interested in, which is the vessels, the heart, are not shown. There are also methods to do so-called in-painting. So that's to remove the vessels from the image entirely based on the surrounding information. And you get an image which contains everything but what you're interested in. This is cool because you can do it and subtract the original image from the thus in-painted image and get an image that contains only the vessels. And these vessels are now not truncated. So this is nice. Let's see if we can use it. Here I'm presenting uh, data from a phantom scan, actually, with 133 projections. And basically, between any two of these projections, I can now compute the cost function mentioned earlier. I'm showing that in this triangular shape down here. Basically, every point, if you choose it, you have an index i and an index j. That's the two projections that are being compared. And I'm just showing a grayscale version of the cost function in this image. Now you can start optimizing. I'm just doing one parameter here. The V-shift, because most of the motion of the heart is usually in an up-down direction. And there's, of, of course, breathing motion. There's heart motion, so it's pulsating. And we're trying to estimate that. And as you can see, the result, the end result that we get is actually this red-black line, which contains, first of all, heartbeats, and second of all, breathing motion. If you do a frequency analysis on it, you can actually separate the two and thus have gating information present. Now, this is just a sign in on the, the close up of the image. This is basically before the optimization and after. And the remaining inconsistency in this image is actually interesting. It's due to the non um, rigid deformation of the heart. This brings me to the last um, of my applications today, and that is registration. So, in this case, we have two full 3D scans with a couple of hundred projections. And we have uh, here an overlay of the two, if they're perfectly fitting. But you can see that there has been motion between the source and the target. And the goal in this case is to recover that motion based on consistency conditions. The disadvantages of the usual methods, which use a reconstruction first, so you do a 3D volume and then compare on a voxel-based, uh, uh, the, the, the intensity of the voxels in the 3D volumes and then align them. It's memory and time intensive. You get all sort of reconstruction artifacts, for example, if you have very few images. And then that may affect the quality of the registration. So the setup is this. This is basically a visualization of the whole trajectory. The blue one is slightly rotated and moved with respect to the black one. You can see it from the side here. The black one is on the entire flat. You're looking in the direction of the projections on that plane. And the blue one is rotated towards it. And again, this is a plot of the uh, consistency conditions, uh, the cost function for the rotations and for the translations. And again, as before, the correct alignment is in the center in these plots. What you can see is that the cost function is rather smooth and it has a clear, very clear minimum for the correct alignment. So this is now the end result that you would get. You have the reference, you have the initial misalignment, you see a lot of uh, green and uh, purple because the two images do not match well. However, in the reference and the proposed, you do not see much of a difference except where the scans do not overlap. So if, this is, if there's no color information in here, if it's entirely gray, that is a good thing. It means the alignment is correct. The amazing thing in this is that we've used only nine projections out of several hundred, and we're still able to get the same result as with an intensity-based registration, which also did a reconstruction in the process. So this brings me to my summary. Um, I've explained to you what the epipolar consistency conditions in X-ray images are. They are able to verify redundant information in any particular pair of images. And I've shown you a cost function that I can use to quantify that. Uh, I told you that there's a wide range of applications, not only motion compensation. 
But I've specifically shown you three examples of motion compensation here. The tracking of unknown objects, which is amazing because you have no information of the object, you're not able to reconstruct it, and you're still able to determine its position. The gating and rotation and geography, which is amazing because there is a lot of truncation and there is also deformation of the heart and you're still able to extract a sensible signal out of the images. And finally, a 3D, 3D registration algorithm which uses only nine views out of several hundred in the projection, in the reconstruction. Yeah, so this concludes my talk and I hope you got a good impression of what I've been working on over the five years. And uh, yeah, I thank you very much. Thank you.